Ubi est caritas et amor Deus ipsi est. Where there is charity and love, there is God. Where there is charity and love, there is God. Don't forget that. Remember it. Where there is charity and love, there is God. That's what the whole early church was about. That was not their primary theme song or saying, but it's a good one for us. Where there is charity and love, there is God. And the presence of Dorcas in that community in Joppa was a good working example of the charity and love of God being present in Joppa through Dorcas. And she was quite an extraordinary woman. Dorcas, by the way, means gazelle. Huh? Very cool. Yeah. Which means she moved fast, quick, purposeful, and guess what? She burned herself out and died. I didn't say there was a happy ending. <laughs> what I'm saying is, she practiced the charity and love and the presence of God, but she did it in such a way that she just burnt herself out and died. And she had had a gathering of a whole community of women, widows, and widows in those days, of course, had it pretty tough because if the family was poor, uh, the widows would not be allowed uh, to go in with the extended family to be cared for. They were just out on their own. And of course, they didn't have businesses, most of them, or there was no social security, there was no safety net or anything like that. So they were pretty much on their own. So what Dorcas did was to gather the widows together uh, in, in a community, and what she did was she made clothes for them. She figured out how to get enough food together. She was a good hustler, got food and clothing and, uh, and lodging and the whole shooting match. Uh, but she had an attack of stupid, like a lot of us do. And just don't think it's Dorcas, and just don't think it's somebody else that you know. It can also be you having an attack of stupid where you think you can do it all. And you can do it all by yourself. And you never get cranky by doing it all yourself. And you never blame anybody about how lazy you all are because you don't help, because look at everything I'm doing, and nobody's helping me, like we should read your mind. <laughs> well, that's what Dorcas was doing. And she died. So the widows, of course, were totally out of sorts, what are they supposed to do now? Because Dorcas had not taught them to do a thing. She had not passed on any of her skills. And she died. So they called on Peter, who was a couple days away, who was in, in the area, and he came over, and uh, he shipped everybody out of the room, and he said the kind of prayer that you would say over somebody who has died. Lord, take care of this servant of yours. I love her, I love him. Please love him the same way in this life as in the next life. And uh, let him be a good angel and be a good visitor and a good prayer for all of us who are here on earth. And so that's what he prayed, but guess what? The Lord said, you're right, Peter. She is a good person and she did not finish her task on earth. And so he brought her back to life through the prayers of Peter and also the sadness and the prayers of the women. Didn't happen often, doesn't happen very often at all in church history, as you know. A couple of times, significant circumstances, and this was in the earliest years of the church in which these kinds of impacts really meant something. So <clears throat> Dorcas gets up. She goes back to her about her business of being the head of that group but she gets smart. She realizes the reason she died was she was not very bright about how she was handling things. It says that she was a caring kind of person, right? In the text itself. She was a caring woman, compassionate woman. She knew how to make clothes. She knew how to hustle for food. She knew how to find lodging for everybody. She gathered her community in the name of Jesus. But what she hadn't done 
was to pass on any of the knowledge that she had acquired and hadn't passed it on. She had not identified any of those widows and their skills and abilities. You see where I'm going with this? So that when she died, it all died with her. And the community collapsed. And that is why God brought her back to the living. So that he would buy her and that community time to become the kind of good news community of faith that is necessary in every time and in every place. It is the kind of community in which she taught those women how to sew so that it was good enough that they could sell it and open up a business. And then they could rent lodgings. And then they could buy more product to make more stuff so that they could have a business going so that those women actually had value and worth and purpose and meaning, and they were then not on the margins of society looking like, oh, you poor baby, you're so broken down, you need so much help. Let me give you $5 so you can go to McDonald's, okay? <laughs> and I feel good about me, and she'll feel good about her for a meal but precisely what has been accomplished. <laughs> Over the longer haul, not very much. That's why God raised up Dorcas to become a teacher and an educator of living life. And she mentored those women into becoming business women and intelligent business women. She identified those who were capable of being good seamstresses for good quality product, and she identified women who were capable of doing other things in a different way so that she was able to expand the market <coughs> and expand the income and expand the lodgings and also give worth and value to widows who otherwise would have been out on the street barely surviving at all. So God did a wonderful thing and didn't do it just because he thought Dorcas was a terrific person. He did it because she was going to be a useful person, because she was not a slow learner. Remember her nickname, right? The gazelle. Learn quick. <coughs> and there was a, uh, well, it depends on how you take a look at this stuff, actually. Uh, I don't know how many of you, uh, I, I, got, I got called out on this at the early service, by the way, <laughs> and rightly so, because I said, every one of you, as a Christian with faith, should be able to look at anybody at any time and see the presence and the person of Christ in them. And everybody just about at the early service, most people just looked and agreed. A couple of people have said, are you crazy? <laughs> and one person in particular said, I have no clue what you mean. So, then there was an example that somebody said. Uh, a guy, his blood pressure was so high the other day, came over to the house, and his blood pressure was so high that he was bleeding from the nose. He couldn't get it stopped. He was because his sister was really, really upset, bad, upset. And he was upset about her being very upset. And so I said, what did you do? Well, I helped to stop the bleeding, and I calmed him down. And I said, well, what Christ did you, did you see there? What do you mean, what Christ did I see there? I didn't see any Christ there. I said, yes, you did. You saw the suffering Christ, the one who bleeds. That's what you saw. And you responded to the suffering of Christ in that person by calming the person down, bringing the blood pressure down, and also stopping the bleeding. And that is precisely what your call is at all times and a place and occasions with people. You are to seek out the Christ in them. Now that may be the Christ of hope, it may be the Christ of prayer, it may be the Christ of suffering, 
It may be the Christ of the future. It may be the Christ of truth. It may be the Christ of beauty. It will be a gift of some sort that you will see and find in the other person, and that will be the face that Christ presents to you. And that is precisely how Dorcas, given her second chance, responded with her life. She looked at those women in a very, very different fashion. Instead of needy, dependent, and oh my God, poor things. She saw them as capable, competent, and hopeful, and useful in society. And if you're going to see the face of Christ in those women, you can certainly do that because Christ also was very useful in his own ministry, in his life. He was a healer, for one thing, was he not? He was an excellent and outstanding teacher for another thing. And he was also one who was able to bring groups of people together so that they could communicate in a variety of ways. Now, what that means is that there's not a single person you will ever meet in your lifetime that doesn't present the face of God, the face of Christ, to you. It is a matter of you working at it enough and taking the time to see what face is being presented. There was a, uh, <coughs> a, a guy who was out hunting uh, with a friend of his, and they uh, were out there, and the bird dog, after they shot, shot the, first, uh, the first bird, uh, the dog went off and fetched fetched the bird and brought it back, ran right across the water. And uh, his buddy didn't say anything. And then they got two more birds, and each time the dog ran across the water, came running back with the birds. And finally, the guy who owned the dog said to his friend, don't you see anything special about my dog? <laughs> yep, he can't swim. <laughs> Yeah, that's missing the face of Christ, okay? Yeah. And that is pretty much a good metaphor for us. We're busy. We're not expecting to see his presence in our daily lives. We're not expecting to see his presence in the face of other people. And yet that is precisely the calling to which we have been called to find the Christ. And if you're doing that wimpy Christ, I will just have to throttle you all. You do not think of Christ as the guy who's coming up with long blonde hair and blue eyes, doesn't wear glasses because he has perfect eyesight too, who is going to come and be nice and sweet to you. You know from your own study he was not always a sweetie pie. He talked hard and truthfully to people. He taught when it was time to teach. He healed when it was time to heal. He prophesied about people's bad behavior and how it was going to lead them to hell when it was called upon. And he fed people when they were hungry and then sent them home to live their lives. There are many faces of Christ. And those are the ways in which you need as a Christian to look at other people, to find the face that is being presented now, my wife had me watch a movie, and I'm especially sensitive now, <laughs> called, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just now for the moment, yeah, called City of Joy with Patrick Swayze. What can I tell you? Go ahead, sigh now. Oh, I know. Oh, he's just so hot. <laughs> but in any case, in the City of Joy, uh, it's a three-star movie, and uh, Patrick Swayze plays an American dentist named Max who's doing an internship in India uh, for part of his training, and he doesn't understand why the nurse who is from Ireland, Ireland has finished her training and has stayed there in that community in India. He just can't process that. Uh, and 
but the longer Max lives there and works there and becomes part of that community, the more he feels a part of it and believes that these people with whom he lives really are part of his family, his extended family. And then his internship ends, and at the end of the movie, as Max's time is completed in India, the nurse says, Max, now you're free to go. And Max quickly responds, no, now I'm free to stay. You see, he found the face of Christ and was making response to it. And he was able to mature beyond the poverty and beyond the bad water and beyond all the negatives that you can think of of a poor community and slum dog millionaire. And find what? A family of God. But that's only by looking through the face and for the face of Christ. And he found talent, skill, hope, spiritual gifts. He found all kinds of wonderful things. And that is precisely the calling to which you and I are called. To find the giftedness which is present in each one of us. And when Christ raised up, Dorcas, the gazelle, you keep in mind he wasn't doing a miracle just to do a miracle for Dorcas. She had no say in it at all. He made that miracle for that group and that community of women at that time. So Dorcas could get it right. So whatever it is that you do when you are responding to the face of Christ, whatever face it is you are making response to, you see to it that you do it right. You don't hit and run. You don't throw money at it and run. You make your commitments, you stick to them. You do it all right. And that then is what Dorcas did, finally, at last. And a very sizable and significant Christian community grew in Joppa. And that's how the church grew, and that's how it still matters today, by means of identifying the Christ in us and making good response to, them, to that presence. Amen.